Lord, that, um, that your word would go from logos to rhema, that it would go from the written word to the living word within our hearts. Lord, that you would use, that you would um, inspire us, Lord, and that you would uh, increase our faith, O oh God, and that you would challenge us, Lord, to live beyond the natural into the spiritual, Lord. Lord, beyond um, our thoughts and into your thoughts and your ways, God. Lord, help us to not be careful, but help us to be uh, filled with faith, O oh God. Lord, that, that we would be partnering with you, doing the things that only you can do. Lord, so we ask that your word would become alive to me and to us, and that you would inspire us, Lord, and increase our faith, that we would live beyond uh, the natural and into the spiritual, into the very kingdom of God. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, we'll continue in our study through Mark, and we're at Mark chapter 3. And just a reminder to you that Mark, otherwise known as John Mark in the scripture, he's not spoken of a lot, but we do see him coming up concerning Paul and Barnabas in their missionary journeys. It's, a, it's an interesting passage where John Mark uh, leaves them during the first missionary journey, and uh, Barnabas seemed to be more um, patient with John Mark than Paul, because come the second missionary journey, Paul didn't want John Mark to, to come with them. And so John Mark went with um, Barnabas and uh, Paul and Silas teamed up together. What's wonderful about all that is, is that Scripture does not um, candy coat or dress up uh, godly people, but um, Scripture presents people of God just as they are with all of their flaws. And, uh, of course, we think of the Old Testament, so many characters, and the New as well, Peter and his denial, uh, John Mark and his abandoning them, um, Paul himself saying that he comes in weakness and that he doesn't do the things that he wants to do and does do the things that he doesn't want to do. And I just thank God that Scripture is so, um, so honest about the people of God who we aspire to, right? Who we aspire to. And so thank you, Lord, for that. Okay, so here Mark is, is writing his gospel. Um, initially, the gospel of Mark was not embraced by the church, Mark not being an apostle. Uh, but later it was learned um, that because of his close relationship with Peter, in fact, Peter actually refers to John Mark in his letter, 1 Peter, as my son in the faith, Mark, John Mark, um, that, um, that later it became known that, um, that really this is uh, the gospel of Peter in the sense that uh, Mark is uh, taking dictation, if you will. Um, from Peter. Um, at that point, Mark not only was accepted, but Mark, it's believed, had become a source material for both Matthew and Luke. And so just a couple of things that I found in my research. But here is the piece that I want to bring out to you and where we're going to end up this morning. The Gospel of Mark is written to the Christians in Rome. And it's written to the Christians in Rome during a time of brutality by Nero the emperor. It was under Nero that, uh, that Paul was beheaded and Peter was crucified, uh, both he and his wife, so tradition tells us. Um, but he was absolu absolutely bloodthirsty, uh, not only with Christians, but also with his own family, having his, I believe, um, brother or cousin executed, and then his mother wasn't too happy about that, and he had, he had her whacked as well, as we say in Italian vernacular. This was a brutal, brutal man, and the Christians are dying uh, in droves, and they're dying in the most grotesque and brutal ways, even to the point of being hung on a cross and then lit with, with fire to bring light to his circus, if you will. And um, this is who Mark's writing to, and, and how does he bring comfort? He brings comfort to them by emphasizing the suffering of Christ. Of all the Gospels, the third of Mark deals with the passion of Jesus. And so how does he bring comfort to the church? He brings comfort to the church by saying, this is the life. 
This is a life of bearing our cross. This is a life of serving. This is a life of caring. This is a life of giving. This is a life where we will be hated as Jesus was hated, that we will be persecuted as Jesus was persecuted. And so may we find comfort in that. Okay, here we go. Right, because at the end of this life comes our reward. This is not our time for reward. This is our time for service. This is our time for bringing people to Christ. This is our time of illuminating, if you will, the goodness of God. We will have all of eternity to, to be in our, in our heavenly lazy boys, if you will. And we'll have all of eternity to, to reap the fruit of this life. This is a life to serve. This is a life to give. This is a life to live the life of Jesus in thought, word, and deed. Okay, I want to come back uh, to the beginning of chapter 3, but let's start with verse 7. But Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the sea. And a great multitude from Galilee followed him. And from Judea and Jerusalem and Idiom and beyond the Jordan and those from Tyre and Sidom, a great multitude, when they heard how many things he was doing, came to him. This great mob of people again and again, they came to Jesus. They, the crowds, they, they came to Jesus because of the miracles. They came to Jesus for what they could get. Right? They came to Jesus for what they could get, not to support him in his calling, not to bring comfort to him in some way, not to, um, not to necessarily advance uh, what Jesus was establishing, the kingdom of God and the hearts of men and women. They came to take. They came for the benefits. Dear ones, may I say at the very get-go that when we come to church, we don't come to take. We come to give. We don't... Now, now, let me say this. I get it. I love being here because I get so much from you. But I get from you in the context of giving. I get from you in the context of serving. I get from you in the context of offering leadership and glorifying Jesus. Does that make sense? So we need to be careful about that, don't we? Verse 9. So he told his disciples because of the unruly crowd that a small boat should be kept ready for him because of the multitudes, lest they should crush him. For he healed many, so that as many had afflictions, pressed about him to touch him. You can just feel the energy of people wanting a healing, wanting a touch. Verse 11, And the unclean spirits, whenever they saw him, fell down before him and cried out, saying, You are the Son of God. But he sternly warned them that they should not make him known. Now, why would a demon make this pronouncement in this mob of people, a demon within a person, a person demon-possessed? Why would they make this declaration, you are the son of God? Well, we see it in Scripture often concerning names. And there's something about knowing the name and the quality of a person that, that establishes a sense of control. I don't fully understand it, but that's what that's about. They're, 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 they're declaring that they know, I know who you are. I, I know who you are. And there is this, there is this, this sense of um, you're not getting away with who you are. You're, you're not going to be hiding from me. I know who you are. I know what you're about. You're the son of God. As if, as if that knowledge would intimidate Jesus or as if that knowledge would put Jesus in a place where he's feeling like he was found out in some way. It's, it's a strange concept, but here's what I want you to see. Even the demons believe and tremble. You see, dear ones, God help me, but I am so challenged to, to not just believe, but to live. To not just know, but to do. You see, we, we can read the scriptures that say that we are to go into all the world. We can know that all day long. But here's what we're doing, dear ones. We're believing it, and we're putting, we're putting action to what we believe. Even the demons believe and tremble. May I say to you that, that our, our challenge is to go beyond believing. Our challenge is to attach action to faith. 
What does James say? Even the demons believe and tremble, but do you want to but but do you want to know, oh foolish man, that faith without works is dead? We just have to be careful of that. And you know who needs to be careful of thinking that because it's because we're believing it, we're doing it? You know who really needs to be careful with that? Teachers. Preachers. You know why? Because I can espouse with great passion the things of God and not doing it. And there's something that happens in me. I feel like I'm kind of doing it because I'm preaching it. I'm not. I'm not. I can preach about evangelism to the point that I almost feel like I'm evangelizing. And I'm not. I can preach about giving to the point that I feel like I'm giving. But I'm not. I can preach about love and patience to the point that I feel like I'm really doing it. And all I'm doing is talking about it. So I'm the first one. I think preachers and teachers really have to be careful to not confuse talking about it and doing it. Okay, even the demons believe and tremble. Say this little bit about Jesus telling them, hey, get a boat ready because they're about to crush me. I have a granddaughter. We love to play hide and seek, right? You know what's amazing about my little granddaughter? She hides in the same place every time. (laughs) She hides in the same place every time. And it would be so easy for me where after... Eight, nine, ten, ready or not, here I come, go right to the closet and say, I got you. But that's not what the game's about. The game's about participating and being relational with little Lux. And so I walk around knowing exactly where she is and saying, where is Lux? Where is Lux? I'm purposely limiting myself for the sake of relationship. You know, last night I was looking at the moon. Did you see the moon last night? And I looked at the moon and I thought about this passage where Jesus says, get a boat ready in case they crush me. And I'm thinking, what? You made that. And there's a lot more of that where that came from. Why does Jesus purposely limit himself? Because he wants to do it with us. He wants to do it with us. Right? Right? How would they believe if they haven't heard? And who's the the hearing come from? You and me, right? He wants to, he purposely limits himself. And so isn't that fabulous, right? Okay, verse 13. And he went up on the mountain and called to those he himself wanted. And in Luke, where Luke talks about this in 612, going up to the mountain is a place of prayer. He's about to make a big decision. He's about, to, he's about to decide the 12 who become the embryo of the new Jerusalem. It's a big deal. These guys are the pillars of the church. See, at some point, Jesus is going to be gone physically, but very present by his spirit. And these guys are going to continue this work. This is no small decision. So he goes up to, to the mountain to pray. Are we praying about big decisions? Laura and I almost did a whopper yesterday, and I, I just thank God that we're, we're in prayer because we were about to do a whopper, and, and we didn't have a peace about it. And high five, honey. Are we praying before big decisions? Pray. Pray, dear ones. Jesus did before the picking of the 12. And they came to him, sorry, and called to him those he wanted, he himself wanted, And they came to him. I'm reading out of the New King James, by the way. Verse 14. Then he appointed 12 that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach and to have power to heal sickness and to cast out demons. You see, Jesus started in Mark 1 saying, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God. And the time is fulfilled and he's came to to preach the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is both proclaimed and demonstrated. The kingdom of God is the authority of God, that wherever God is, there is authority. That's why he said the kingdom of God is in your midst. Now, the kingdom of God was in in their midst because of who he is. He's God. But guess what? If you believe the Trinity, you and I have the spirit of God, and so guess what's present? 
the kingdom of God. And we just have to learn to, number one, repent and believe that, and number two, learn how to operate in the things of the kingdom of God. And that is something, you know, Peter and I were going into the park and we're having conversation with people on Tuesday nights, and we're trying to get to this place where we're having conversation, we're sharing our story, we're, we're sharing our testimony, and we're, we're trying to discern, Lord, is there something that you want to do here, something of power? You see, that is this call. If, if, oh, I want to be careful here, dear ones. But if the gospel to us is just the story that Jesus died to forgive me of my sin, that's huge. That's huge, right? That, that I am forgiven of my sin and that because of the righteousness of Christ, I am, uh, heaven is mine. But what, is, what does God want to do through Eddie right now? Is, is it just a matter of fire insurance? I got mine. Or does God want to demonstrate something of himself through my life? I don't know what that is. But the scripture gives us lots of things to be anticipating and praying for and being available for. However God wants to use us. The kingdom of God. Let me say something else. I do a lot more of kingdom thinking when I'm with somebody else. Can I be honest with you? I'll walk through the park and see people who are homeless and and I walk right past them. But if I have a brother or sister with me, Peter and I on Tuesday nights, there's something that happens when we're together that suddenly my faith is changed. And I'm really eager to to participate together in something of God. You know, that's true for prayer, too. Someone had come to me and said, you know, I just really need encouragement to pray. It's like, well, come to times that we pray. Start there. Start there. It's okay. You know, the enemy would love to get us down on ourselves because I'm just not doing a lot when I'm by myself. Well, we're supposed to be doing this life together. Right? right, right, right. When, when he called us to these things, he called them as a group, okay? So um, look at this fabulous passage. It begins to list, oh, by the way, he called them, he appointed 12 that they might be with him, right? That he might send them out to preach and to have power to heal sickness and cast out demons, right? The Bible says that the Son of Man came to destroy the works of the devil, That's what's happening here. And that's what he wants to do through our life. And we get to figure that out. We get to walk in humility and say, Lord, how do you destroy the works of of the devil in my own life and in the life of others, right? That is our challenge as disciples of Jesus. How do I do the life of Jesus in thought, word, and deed? Does that sound familiar, folks? That's our mission statement, isn't it? I love the part that he called them to be with him. Hey, folks, you want to disciple someone? Just call them to be with you. Hey, I'm going to Home Depot. Want to come? Hey, I'm going out to lunch. Want to come along? Right? Bible study is is vital, right? I I memorize scripture and I got into the word and so much of what you hear me just saying is because I've taken study serious. But you know what? Having the word of God in us, now let's go do Home Depot together. Now let's go do lunch together. Now let's go take a walk in the park together. Just invite people with you, and you'll enter into discipleship. It just happens. You can't help but not talk about the Lord and see opportunities to minister the grace of God. Look at these people that he's calling. He calls four fishermen, one hated uh, publican, tax collector. He calls... um, He calls a a guy from a very violent political party, Judas. That's six. And the other six, they're just a name. Now we hear things about them. But but in this opening, opening part of Mark 3, think about this for a minute. Fortune 500 companies. Think about what they do. Hey, hey. Come and use our services because we got this person and all these degrees and all this experience and this is a person that you want to have do your service, right? These bios that are just so done, you know, to sell their services. 
What is Jesus doing? Just give the name. Why? Because it ain't about them. It's about God. It's about God. I don't know. Maybe we ought to take a look at our website and just, you know, not even have my picture. Just Pastor Colin Eddy. Oh, maybe I'm being a little ridiculous here. But you get my point. Jesus does nothing about fancy bios with these guys. Why? Because it ain't about them. It's about the work of God through their life. Amen? Amen. Okay. Mark chapter 3, verse 20. Then the multitude came together again so that they could not so much as eat bread. But when his own people heard about this, they went out to lay hold of him. For they said he's out of his mind. Guess who his own people are? It's his family. We're going to see this picking up in just a minute. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, He is Beelzebub. And by the ruler of the demons, he cast out demons. Beelzebub was a, was a, a pagan idol. And basically what they're saying is, This man is demon-possessed. So he called them to himself and said to them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. Who said that in a speech? Abraham Lincoln, that's right. And if a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand but has an end. No one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless... He first binds the strong man, and then he will plunder his good. good. So his own people, that was his family. Um, and really, they're, they're, it's written in such a way as if to say they're not so far from the scribes who saw Jesus as um, not out of his mind, but actually demon-possessed. The word, the word for take charge in the Greek is the same word used for arresting him. Folks, this was an intervention. Jesus has lost his mind, and we need to get him and bring him back to his senses. How many people have family that see how you live your life in Christ and say, you're nuts? Huh? Hey, folks, don't try to clean that up. That's this life. That's this life. God's ways are not our ways. Now, do, now be, be nice and be kind, but... But be true to your convictions and live the life that Jesus has called you to live. I remember, you know, Laura and I, early on, God called us into inner city missions. And I was 10 years in the Navy and everything was going great. We just had a third child. And God said, okay, um, it's time to give me your youth and not your old age. Um, And so it's time to get out and go into full-time mission work. And I tell you what, our families thought that we were out of our mind. And what really became diff- difficult was we, we had left Italy um, and, and left the service. We were stationed in Italy. Uh, we left the service with no guarantees, but we just had faith that that application to this inner city ministry was going to be, um, uh, that they were going to accept us. And so in the interim, guess who we're living with? We're living with our parents. And it was the hardest thing in the world because they were like, huh? What? You just had a baby, and you left the security of insurance. You left the security of military service, and, you know, you're, you're, huh? I remember my dad and I washing the car, and he called me Holy Joe all the time. And he said, "Uh, so, uh, Holy Joe, this is after, you know, staying with them for two weeks, staying with Lord's parents for two weeks, and then now we're back for them for two weeks. And my dad says, hey, Holy Joe, uh, what's plan B? And I said, Dad, there is no plan B. We're, to have a plan B is to not have faith in plan A. We'll believe in God. And all my dad did was shrug his head and say, oh, he did, kind of did a lurch, you know. Ugh. That's this life, folks. That's this life. Now look what Jesus says. Oh, let me catch up my thought here. He says, if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but has no end. Let me back up. 
and a house is divided against itself, that house will not stand. You know what I'm seeing in this passage? That Jesus forbids sectarianism, which is an excessive attachment to sect, party, or religion. John 9, 38 through 40. Now John answered him saying, Teacher, we saw someone who does not follow us casting out demons in your name. And we forbade him because he does not follow us. But Jesus said, Do not forbid him. For no one who works a miracle of my name can soon afterwards speak evil of me. For he who is not against us is on our side. How much theology, how much correct theology does it take to give someone a glass of water in Jesus' name? Hmm? How much correct theology does it take to give someone a glass of water in Jesus' name? Jesus is saying, do not forbid them. Folks, we've become way too comfortable in being divided against ourselves. There's way too much of it. You know what Jesus says? Matthew 13, 24. Let's go there. I want to read that. Twenty-four. Another parable he put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. So that servant of the owner came and said to him, Sir, do you not, sir did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? He said to them, an enemy has done this. The servant said to him, do you want us then to go and gather them up? But he said, no, least while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather together the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them but gather the wheat into the barn. The harvest is the judgment, dear ones. Laura and I have a bush in the front of our house. And, you know, we want our bushes to grow. And I'm watering, I'm watering, and I'm trying to make little pools of water so that the water stays on the high side of the bush so it's always wet, you know. And I want my bushes to grow. And on the one bush, there's weeds all around it, and it's the smallest of the bush. And I'm so tempted to just pull out that weed. But I'm concerned about pulling up the root of the bush. That's what Jesus is saying here. We're so quick to pull up tares. Look, you're doing this wrong. I don't agree with that. And we run the risk of killing, destroying the work of God. We've just got to be careful, folks. we just got to be careful. A house divided against itself will not stand. You know, Laura's dream, right? People complaining, being critical, finding fault. I love the fact that she woke up from that dream crying. I mean, the world sees the church, and we are just taking sides all day long. How is that glorifying God? Look, I don't get it myself. All I know is it doesn't take a lot of theology to give someone a glass of water in Jesus' name. Why can't we find things that we agree on? Why do we have to be so apt to correcting and destroying the work of God, I believe? Look, I get it. I get it. If you dug deep enough, you probably find holes in my theology. We've got to make a choice. Are we about glorifying the Lord and, and letting the church be something that is that is healing, that is caring, that is giving? 
that is forgiving, that is long-suffering, that looking past and not getting so hung up on the differences, oh, we pulling up tears, right? Pulling stuff up, and in the process, we're ruining the work of God. We're, we're pulling up the root of the good stuff as well. All right, everybody, that's my pet pee for the day. Melanie Green, I love this story. Melanie Green. Remember the, the whole time with Jim Baker? What a, what a mess, right? What a mess. I get it. Jim Baker, Jimmy Swagger, my goodness. Talk about the church seemingly off the rails. But you know what made it even worse? That they blasted it on television. Rather than one-on-one -on -one finding some kind of resolution, forgiveness, confession, one-on-one. -on -one. No, no, no. They blasted on the TV. What are we doing? Why are we publicizing our arguments? Honestly, Laura and I, you guys don't know the half of the things we argue about, and it's going to stay that way. What are we doing? You know, Melanie Green, Keith Green's wife, she was on a plane, and a guy sat next to her, and she introduced herself as a Christian, and the guy said, oh, boy, aren't you guys in the news? It was during the Jim Baker thing. And her response is perfect. She said, yeah, we do have our problems. We, not him, not the bad guy, we have our problems. And I love the story concerning Jim Baker, Ruth Graham. As the story goes, he happened in the Baptist church that the Graham family went to. Right? And the first three rows, right, are all Graham family. And Jim Baker came into this church just wanting well, I suppose just went in comfort. And he walked in and all the eyes looked at him with a snare. And Ruth Graham, God bless it, it's a true story. Look it up, Ruth Graham and, Billy, and Jim Baker. She got up in front of everyone and she motioned, come and sit with me. Come and sit with me. That's the kind of church I want to be a part of, right? I want to be a part, of a part of a church that doesn't find fault and doesn't ridicule and doesn't correct, that, that we see the good in just simply giving a glass of water. Or we'll kill ourselves. I wonder if the church is being empty these days is, is part of that. We've just become so critical. We've become a house divided against itself. The unpardonable sin, real quick, and then I want to get back to the first part of this chapter. What's the unpardonable sin? Blaspheme against the Holy Spirit. What is that? It's this. It's to call light darkness and what is good evil. Isaiah 5.20. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light, light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. It's the tragedy of a hardened heart. And it's not an isolated act, but a settled condition of the soul. J.C. Riley, um, the, uh, the same man who uh, we think of here, the Riley Bible, he says, those troubled about it are most unlikely to have committed it. If you're concerned about the unforgivable sin, blaspheme of the spirit, if you're concerned about that, most likely you haven't committed it. What is blaspheme of the Holy Spirit? It's not recognizing the work of God, and it's calling what is good evil, what is darkness light. It's a relationship where God is extending his grace, and you're not accepting it. Basically, blaspheme of the Holy Spirit is not accepting the wooing of God bringing you to Christ. It's, 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 it's not recognizing the good and seeing it as evil or seeing it as something other than God. It's a condition of the heart. It's not a one-time thing, but it's, it's a lifetime of saying, it ain't for me. That's blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Okay. Healing on the, let's see. Um, this final part concerning his brother and sister. Brother and, brothers and sisters. I believe it's plural. Oh. Uh, they came to him. So this is a continuation of what we started reading. Verse 31, his brother 
brothers and his mother came, and standing outside, they sent to him, calling him. And a multitude was sitting around him, and they said to him, Look, your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. Um, in Mark in Mark 6, coming up, there's a better description of his family. There's uh, James and, and, and Joes, Joes and Judas and Simon and his sisters as well. They took offense at him. You know, it's interesting, the Catholics, so how do the Catholics explain that Mary had children, right? Because they, God bless them, I'm, I'm not trying to divide anything here, but just for your information, right? Um, they, um, they, because they, they see the Virgin Mary as still a virgin, right? So how do they explain the family? Well, their explanation is that Joseph came to the marriage with these children already. So, I don't know, if that's something you think about, it's something I think about, and that's the explanation from them. But Jesus says in verse 33, Who is my mother and who is my brother? And he looked around in the circle at those who sat about him and said, Here are my mother and my brothers, for whoever does the will of God is my mother and my brother. Okay? Um, Let's go back to... Three, starting in one. And he entered the synagogue again, and the man was there who had a withered hand. So they watched him closely, whether he would heal him on the Sabbath, so that they might accuse him. Why are these guys there? They're there to find fault with Jesus. They're there to accuse Jesus. They're not there to worship. They're there to find fault. Right? Verse 3. And he said to the man who had the withered hand, step forward. It's interesting, the NIV puts it this way. Stand up so that everybody can see you. Jesus is about to heal a man on the Sabbath, and Jesus is not being quiet about it. He wants him to stand so that everyone can see him. Dare I say, Jesus is about to pick a fight. Jesus is about to pick a fight. It's exactly what he did with the healing of the man at the pool when he said, pick up your bed and walk. Why? Because he knew that on the Sabbath, picking up your bed and walking was breaking the Sabbath. And Jesus is about to pick a fight. He says, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill it? But they kept silent. And when he looked around at them with anger, being grieved by the hardness of their heart. Hardness of their heart. My mind goes back to what we talked about in the previous chapter concerning wineskins. Concerning wineskins. Wineskins that are brittle, that are inflexible, and cannot contain the work of God. They burst. These people have hard hearts. They're not, they're not recognizing the visitation of Jesus. They're not, they're not going with the grace of God. They kept silent. He said to the man, stretch out your hand, and he stretched it out, and his hand was restored as whole as the other. Then the Pharisees went out and immediately plotted with the Herodians, which was the political party, against him, how they might destroy him. How was Mark bringing comfort to this persecuted church? We're only in chapter 3, dear ones. And he's already saying, look, they are hell-bent on destroying Jesus. So if you're also dealing with persecution, be true to the Lord. Our reward is yet to come. Amen? Amen. Worship team, come on up. Come on up, worship team. Let's, let's uh, close with a song. Um... Just wait upon the Lord for a minute. You know what's amazing about the Pharisees? Let me just share this. The Pharisees and their rules, right? The hardening of the heart, the the brittle wineskin. The Mishnah lists 39 Jewish oral traditions. It's not in the scripture, but these are their rules. The first 11 of these were steps leading to the production and preparation of bread, sowing, plowing, reaping, 
binding sheaves, threshing, winnowing, selecting, grinding, sifting, kneading, and baking. That's the first 11 rules. The next 12 applied the similar steps in the preparation of clothing from the shearing of sheep to the actual sewing of garments. These are followed by seven steps in preparing the carcass of a deer for use as food or for leather. The remaining items listed how to do with writing, building, kneading, and extinguishing of fires. And also they dealt with the transportation of articles from one place to another. In addition to these major regulations, see, these are the people that are rejecting Jesus. These are the, these are the, the, the brittle, unflexible wineskins that are insisting that Jesus do it his way and missing the visitation of God. In addition to these major regula regulations, there were countless other provisions concerning the observance of the Sabbath most commonly known as the so-called Sabbath day's journey, somewhat less than three-quarters of a mile. It was also counted as a Sabbath breaking. It was also counted as Sabbath breaking to look in a mirror fixed to the wall and also even lighting a candle. Do you get the sense of this now? Do we just see this as those lousy Pharisees? Or do we look within our own hearts and see the, 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 the possibility of being pharisaical within our own hearts about rules and about hardening of heart and about the opposite of being flexible to how God is working? Right? Do we see within our own hearts the thing of wanting to pull up the tares with no regard for what it does to the work of God? I'm going to tell you a quick story. I know. I already have them up. Peter. Peter, you come to mind all the time. Do you know? I know. He just looked at me like, what did I do? Peter comes in during a Sunday evening service, dear ones. Don't change my story because I like the way I tell it. Peter comes into a Sunday evening service, and he's on the way to a UFO meeting, and he sees our sign saying that service is happening right away, and he comes into a Sunday evening service, maybe 15 of us, nobody even knows this guy, and we're kind of looking at him saying, who brought him? I don't know. Well, so we do our song, right? And then after the song, we do our prayer time, and then after prayer time, we do our teaching with discussion. Right? That is the format for our evening. Don't mess with it. Well, during prayer time, Peter stands up. And he says, this guy that we don't even know, I don't even know his name at this point. Nobody knows who he is. He stands up and he says, right now, I'm standing to my feet to accept Jesus Christ as my Savior and Lord. Now, you would think that I'd be like, hallelujah, hot dog. All I knew was that. Right now, we're taking prayer requests. That's not according to my sheet, because he hit me flat-footed. But you know, I've been around the barn enough to know, Eddie, be flexible here. God is doing something. It's not about my sheet. It's about the Spirit of God. And so I did something that was really ingenious. I leaned forward in the pulpit, and I said to him almost verbatim, do you mean to tell me that right now you're standing to your feet to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? That was my comeback. And he said, uh-huh. And we prayed for him. And I tell you what, for the next six months with Peter, we take these walks and we talked about Jesus, but Peter was talking about Jesus and UFOs. What do I do at that point? The man is in the word of God. The man is in process. The man is hearing from God, and God is pouring into his life. And I just knew the Lord was saying, Eddie, you be very careful here. Don't start tearing up the tears. I'm working. I'm working. I'm working. I'm working. Hey, you know what? In a couple of weeks, he's going to be preaching to you. Amen? 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 Oh, get excited, dear ones. God is working, but we must be flexible. We cannot be brittle. 
We'll make mistakes. You see, that's the thing about being flexible. We're going to make mistakes. Let me just tell you right away, I am going to make some bonehead decisions. I am. But I'm not afraid of it. Because I recognize we learn to walk by walking. Right? Look, none of us are perfect here, but, we, but God help us that we're hungry to accommodate the work of God. Right? Right? And if I make mistakes, guess what? One of you are going to be kind enough to say that was a really stupid decision. And I'm going to say, mm-hmm. Right? Hey, I'd rather be a part of a church that in our being flexible and accommodating the work of God, I'd rather be a church that's willing to make a mistake than us that are too afraid to do that. Amen? I mean, what you see is what you get. My favorite theologian is Popeye. I am what I am, and that's all that I am. That was a joke. All right. On that note, lead us to Jesus. We have a wonderful potluck waiting for us, so be sure to stay and enjoy the yummies. Father, thank you, Lord, for our time together. Thank you for your word. Well, thank you for the food. We ask your blessing upon it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you'd like ministry or prayer, come on up, and we'll linger here for you. Otherwise, we'll see you upstairs. Wonderful potluck. God bless you. Hey, bud. chapel this morning yeah. and you know yeah, you enjoyed that story about you.
HQ of Gene? 